sort of out of body experiences you had in Ezekiel. By all different aspects of, of the prophetic material in the Bible are parallel with these other um, accounts of prophecy and other religious traditions. Um, but then November 5th, um, for in class discussion, no need to prepare in advance, just bring this sheet to class. We look at the image of young ladies or prostitutes in um, prophetic literature. How does the use of the image differ in different passages? What are the different contexts for the image? Do different uses of the image support different purposes? Right? And, and how is Israel figured and why do these feminine images serve the functions that these Jewish prophets want them to serve? And we might split into groups to do that. Um, a lot of um, well, then I'm just jumping ahead. So let's just stick with where we are right now. We're still at the point where it was like a seminar. Okay. But that's the kind of thing I would hand out, um, and they would do. Then, in addition, um, if there's any number of things that we might do in the 150 minutes that I would have. I'm, I bring a lot of materials into the class. I'll bring ancient Near Eastern parallels, which previously I would just mentioned in the lecture. We have this stone, or, you know, you mentioned it. Bring it in, right? Now that connected to the biblical passages. You yourself have that sense of discovering what it's like to see these texts in the way that you see them talk to each other. Interesting things. So I'll bring in ancient Near Eastern parallels to close readings alongside the biblical text. Or we'll do a comparative analysis of laws from, you know, Exodus and from Deuteronomy. What do you think is going on there? The vision of these laws. Um, we'll do a close literary reading about the story, we'll parse the characters and the motives and, you know, think about the work of, like, Robert Alter and Mayor Sternberg and others. Um, we'll look at, we'll do the kind of exercise I gave there, the female images and metaphors used by these prophetic writers, what are they accomplishing? We might, and then we also look at reception history. I bring a lot of things from Midrash and Talmud, I'll bring early Christian interpretation. When we're looking at the Song of Songs, I bring Origin alongside, you know, passages of Talmud that we can see to draw on the same motifs. It's really interesting. Um, so, those are the kinds of things that are happening actually in the class. There's some examples of that. So, um, in other words, there's two things going on. One is study guides that help them prepare material before they get to the class. But second of all, when they just walk into class, sometimes I'm handing them this kind of stuff. This is when we were doing the Binding of Isaac, of course, and there's such a great rabbinic address. That's really the first time we did Binding of Isaac, is that true? We spend a lot of time trying to understand the historical assumptions that underlie the Benny trash. But this, they don't prepare in advance. I hand it out. Now, you know, we, and we've worked through it in one way or another. Now, here I was comparing Midrash, Christian interpretation of the Binding of Isaac, and Islamic interpretation of who was a child, was it Ishmael or Isaac? And, and it was Isaac in Islamic tradition for quite a long time. It's quite late that the idea is that it's Ishmael was substituted. Um, so that we discuss all of those and what are things we've of the interpretation of the Binding Isaac story. Or here's an example of, from Ecclesiastes. Um, identify the subversion of central biblical themes in these passages from Ecclesiastes. One, two, three, four. So I might split them up. I have 25 students and I put them in groups of six or something. And they would spend, you know, 15, 20 minutes reading the passages and thinking, wow, this is completely subverts the image of creation that is given in Genesis 1. Or this completely subverts the notion of human free will. Or this, yeah. And try to get them to make connections across some of the themes that have been playing out so much in the dual domestic history, for example, or the problems. Um, and then we pull it back together and each group will share what they're doing. So um, it's much more you know, teaching, actual teaching. So I, I really enjoyed that and it worked very well. 20, 25 people, you can do all these kinds of things, no problem. Um, there was a little bit of a fear then, however, that I would have the opposite issue where before I was worried that they wouldn't come to sections thinking it was a rehash of class. Now that I had these two class meetings we're doing so much each week, I'm a little afraid they're not watching the lecture because it's a lot of work. And, you know, are they putting in the time for the lecture? So the way that I um, dealt with that was that um, the midterm and the final exam are 100% of the lectures. 100%. Nothing that we do in class is in any way reflected in the lectures. Um, so you, you literally will fail the class if you don't not only watch the lectures, but like study them, which is why it's good to transfer it through there before the lecture college, because they can go back over and take the class and just learn and study it. And they would come to class because, first of all, in a small center city, 
I do see if they're not there, so there's that sort of shame factor. Um, but also, we really were doing really exciting things, and I was convincing them too that to write your final paper, you got to be careful on this stuff. This is what's going to teach you how to write your final paper. So that worked fine. Um, and I taught the course that way with extremely positive student evaluations for a few years, for almost about 20 to 25. The only downside is there's no TF for the class, and that's a lost mentoring opportunity for, for graduate students, which I felt bad about. Then the next stage, um, there were two further developments. One was the publication of the book. Right? So the book version of the lectures, Yale University Press decided that they would just take some of these courses and publish these in a series of the OVO course series. So I was one of the ones chosen for that. So students now have the option of watching the video or reading the corresponding section of the book. And that's really people knowing themselves. I, oh, I will also say that what I did find is that the performance on the exams went way up. Because when students can watch the lectures when they are ready to, and not at 10.30 in the morning, because that's when they have to show up and lecture, they really give the live lecture. But at, you know, 1 in the morning, which for some of them is actually their best working time, then they can turn on the lecture in their pajamas and sit there sipping their coffee, and they can stop and replay it if they miss something or look at the transcript. So retention is a thousand times better, right, than just relying on them being there at the hour and in tune and able to take notes for this one-time performance in the lecture hall. So I, most everybody's getting A's on the midterms on the exam. But they're literally able to answer all of the questions and do so. Well. So I think it's a good thing. I have no problem with everybody in the class getting an A. They just don't think that's not an issue for me. It's for some administrators, but it's not for me. So that was one, one good thing. Um, and people, some people really do prefer the lecture. I've heard that there are some people that like to walk the track. And there's a lot of evidence that kinesthetic you know, activity while listening to something actually increases your attention. So some people will be on a treadmill or they're walking, they just listen to the audio version of it. Other people really prefer the book form. And some like both, they just suck them up, right? And I would always tell them, if you don't have time to watch the lecture, you can probably read the chapter in the book in 20, 25 minutes instead of 15 real-time minutes by watching the lecture. So just judge by your time and do what makes sense. Um, but eventually, I think what happened after doing it for two or three years this way is that word got out that it's not the same class, that the lectures are just sort of this background to Professor is actually teaching. And the teaching part is really fun and really interesting and really exciting. So all of a sudden, um, three years ago, four, three years ago, 60 students show up for the seminar. It was listed as a seminar, but 60 students showed up the first day. And I didn't want to lose any of them. Um, so, you know, some people might have been tempted to say, sorry, I only take 25, this is how I teach this seminar. I thought, no, I can do that. I got 60 kids here who want to study the Bible. This is a great thing. So I said, you can all stay. I will make this work. Somehow I will make this work. Um, so I did. And um, the, the first thing I did was to learn all their names. Boy, I love those photo rosters because it's really important. If I wanted to recreate and retain that feeling that this was a discussion section, I better know all their names. So by the end of the second week, I knew all their names. A lot of humor involved in that. Like every time anybody would raise their hand, I'd tell me your name, tell me your name. And, you know, I'm constantly guessing people's names, making them sit in certain places. I want all the four Carolines in a row. You know, whatever it was, it doesn't matter. It kept people engaged because you have to learn the names. Um, so I did that by the end of the second week. It was funny, and the evaluations at the end, I'm like, oh my gosh, you don't know her names. <laughs> I couldn't believe that. But otherwise, they're going to go out the door, right? Um, that creates a sense of a small seminar. If you're addressing people by name, you're able to do it as soon as possible. The second thing is to really develop a sense of just choreography you know, uh, of the classroom and to uh, figure out ways to just have lots of small group work and wander around and mingle, um, which is what I would do. So I was, I was able to keep the materials I had used before. So as I showed you here with the Ecclesiastes one, which has a list of you know passages, think about subversion of biblical themes, and group one. So now I would have two different group ones with six people on each, two group twos with six people on each, whatever as they go, you've got 15 minutes. And then there's a hive of activity, right? And lots of conversation and hubbub, which is great. And people are reading it out loud and commenting, and I'm wandering around, and the hand goes up if there's a question. But that's sort of the choreography of the room. And then we pull it back in, like, group one, what, you know, who's your spokesperson? And what do you have to say? You know, do you want to say anything other group one? Did they leave anything out? Right. So that's the kind of thing you're doing. Sometimes it's pairs. Turn to the person next to you, read this text, think about the following, and then, you know, pull it out. Um, so it, it, it worked, and the evaluations were very, very positive. Um, and people felt that they were still getting that kind of discussion element and, and attention, 
even though it was a larger number of people, a size that you would think, no, we can only do a frontal lecture in this situation, right? So then I thought, well, if this is what I'm doing, maybe I can use TFs again after all, if, if this number sustains itself. And in fact, the next year it was 55 or 58 or something, it was basically the same. So I had two teaching fellows. But I had to convince the administration to give me teaching fellows because it, I did not want to go back to a discussion section format. So I had to convince the administration that, no, no, this is a flipped classroom. I will employ teaching fellows and they will work as hard as any other teaching fellows. It will just be different. They will sit in the class with, you know, with me in the two 75 minute meetings. When we do these group things for 15, 20 minutes, they'll be wandering around like I am, answering questions, helping people. But I, at, at some point in the week, every week, in one of the two sessions, for 50 minutes, we do split into three groups. A, B, and C, just chop it right off of it, you know, letters A through H and D through whatever. So groups, you know, with uh, 17, 18 students in each one, I think they have 55. Um, and groups A, B, and C go to different physical spaces. It's a scheduling nightmare for the registrar. They have to give me a classroom that's too near my adjacent empty rooms for the entire 75 minutes. That's really hard to find the other campus. <laughs> well, we've managed so far for three years in a row. We have to go downstairs, but it's okay. So in one of the two sessions, they don't, the students don't know which, which I think is a good thing. <laughs> it's better to surprise them. We do split apart for 15 minutes because we get to be more concentrated. We just need what you might be doing like the day that that's you want. That's that's one that I keep as a 50 minute discussion section format. And so the teaching fellows get the opportunity to take kids out for 50 minutes and run. But it's the same thing I run. That we're all like teaching fellows at that point doing that. Um, also, what I do is we rotate. So the first week I'm with A, first teaching fellows with B, and the second teaching fellows with C. The next time you do it, the following week I go with B. Right, so the students keep going to the same place, but we rotate around. So you'll, each person will have one of those sections led by me three, um, three or four out of the 10 or 11 times of the two of 13 weeks of best time starting in the second third week. Right. So now it seems like I had the best of all the worlds. I'm still just doing actual teaching. I'm not standing there waiting for the lecture. The students get the experience of all of these different learning formats, sometimes watching a lecture, which they do electronically in their own time, but they're most mentally capable of having, having an impact. Um, they're also in a setting where they're sometimes working in pairs and then reporting back to a large group, working in small discussion groups and reporting back to a large group, or having the kind of seminar style discussion around the table, closely reading a text together, thinking through larger issues in a sustained way over 15 minutes instead of just sort of 15 minutes to a group conversation, right? So all of these different modalities are going at once, and I'm making decisions about what is, which modality is best suited to the material we're doing at any given time. Is this, is this something that warrants 50 minutes in the seminar style with one of us leading? Is this something I can bring to their attention and throw together by asking people to just pair up for 10 minutes and then pull it back together, right? So, so that's what I'm doing. So NTFs are being employed, which is a good thing. And I have creators, which is also a good thing. Because <laughs> once you get back up to 60, it's like, oh, OK, I'm willing to do 20, 25 in the seminar, but 60 final papers and math exams and midterm exams is a bit much, but you're also trying to teach it. So in many ways, it seemed to me that that was really the best of all possible. So that's now happened, I think, that I had NTFs in that situation. I can't remember now whether it's two times or three times. So it must have been, I think, three times. So I think once the 60 showed up, and I just did it myself somehow. Then the next year, the next two years, um, I, I, two times that I taught it, I had teaching fellows. Um, so, so that's where the course exists right now. Um, one, what I thought I would do now, which obviously we're not going to do, but so I will just explain it to you, and then we'll be done. This was going to sort of be the last 40 minutes or so of, of the session. But um, I don't know if you had a chance to watch the Job lecture. And if you did and you, or you didn't, it's actually good. I mean, it's good if some people did and some people didn't, because that's probably the reality of the class. I mean, people do get to all the lecture material eventually by the end of the, you know, depending on what's going on in their lives that week. They may not read it in time for the class where we're doing something for it. That's become clear to me uh, in teaching this class. And that's OK. I mean, they know they have to know the material for the final exam, and they do, and they're ready for it. But it's not always the case that it's synced up exactly with when I want to talk about it. That's fine. So the reality is I would probably walk into the class and there would be probably 25 or 30 of the students, probably 30 to 35 of the students that actually watched the lecture. And on the whole, my sense is that really most of them have watched the lecture when they were asked. So probably 35 or so watched the lecture and maybe 20 
haven't. They might have skimmed the transcript really quickly, but they may not have watched it. And that's all right. It's, it's, you have to make sure that the activity is going to work um, no matter what. So the one, uh, this is what I do for the Book of Job. This happens to be my favorite book of the Bible, and it also happens to be my favorite class. And this was something that, again, I hit upon completely by accident. It was, I really thought of this 20 minutes before the class, um, two years ago, because I've done it now twice, and I've, I've worked both times. The first time I thought maybe that was a little good, it won't work next year, maybe just work because these kids were particularly creative and really smart. But now it worked really well last time as well, so I'm very hopeful it will continue to work. Um, I had this idea that instead of just sort of rehearsing the themes, which I do fairly well in the lecture anyway, but um, it's sort of abstract and cut and dried. And, and I didn't want Job to be reduced to a kind of just a philosophical discussion or philosophical rumination. I really wanted people to wrap up with the fact that this book is really about the horrific psychological pain and distress that's caused by traumatic events in your life, especially for a person who thinks that they really need to see and understand and feel that crisis, right? Um, so I decided that we were going to um, sort of, I don't want to say act out the, the book of Job. It's not quite that because it requires a kind of second order reflection. So I just walked into the, I, I quickly sat down, it was like 20 minutes before the class, and I quickly ran through the book and I pulled out certain passages, um, which I think you have. So, um, oh no, yeah, I'm giving it to you. This is what I give the students. Um, but I first walk in and I say, hey, who wants to be God? <laughs> Come on, right? Yeah, I'm sure half your hands are going to go up. You know, and so I go, oh, I'll be God. I said, all right, I need, you know, I can, and I do it in groups of two or three. So I need three people to be my prose God. So I get three people, your prose God. I need, but I also need a poetic God, right? Three more people in the way God. Who would like to be Joe? Oh, now they're beginning to see what we're doing. Okay, Joe. Actually, I need four different Joes because we meet four different kinds of arguments, four different attitudes to what's happening in his life, and so we, it's very psychologically complex. Job is a very psychologically complex character, so I need prose Job. So three people do that. Um, what are the ones there? I've got a poetic Job, A, B, C, and D. Then I need Job's wife. I said, remember, there are no small parts, only small actors, because Job's wife only has this one speech, but parse it. You know, she gives two imperative verbs. And what lies behind each of those imperative verbs? You know, what is the whole worldview, the complex worldview that's summed up? What conclusions has she reached in her mind that enabled her to say, curse God? And what conclusions has she reached in her mind about the value of human life in her, you know, imperative verb dying? So it's more than just repeating the words. Think, you know, you should be able to flesh out her worldview. Um, and then each of the friends, Ellie Faz, Bill Dad, so far, and then Ellie. Now, when because I have such a large class, I also have amicus briefs. So if Ezekiel is sitting around and would like to chime in, then he can do so. Lamentations 3 and the author of Second Isaiah and Proverbs. So, um, so if, once we've assigned all these parts, and nobody is doing anything alone. Everybody is always at least two, usually three people. Um, and we can have up to, I guess, 15. So sometimes I've got four people on a part. That's all right. Now you have 15 minutes to do a character study. So just as if you are about to read a part in a play reading or you're about to be in, in some theatrical production, you need to know your character. You need to step inside your character. So I have written down here verses for you to read and to really understand your character's perspective or point of view. So we've got um, prose God, really, God one. You need to really pay attention to Genesis one. Who are you? What is your relationship to humanity and the world there? What do you think of humanity? Look at Job 1 and 2, and then post God is in also 42, 7 through 17. And then the way God speaks to us in Job 30, 40 through 41, verse 6. Um, this is a ton. So what I have here, what I thought we would do, is I had actually Xerox built, so we will not do this now. But people bring their bikes. But here's pros down one, right? So I would have now just handed out all of these, and I would have said, you've got 15 minutes now to read these and get in character now, so that's why it's good to have more than one person do it, because they start to argue with each other and talk. It's like, what do you think he's saying? Because Joe is not easy to understand. And, and, what he's, and, I, and I also ask them to be as specific as possible um, about what it is their character saying. Don't, don't, don't come up with sort of bland statements, but the, get into the details of the charges that are being made. Get into the details of the psychology. Because Joe says actually self-contradictory things, which is not surprising when you are feeling 
horrific pain and rage and anger inducing self medicating things. Um, so when I um, give the you know the, the selection to the God people and ask them, I want you while you're doing this, while you're reading this, I want you to think about what's your relationship to human beings and your role in human life, how important are humans in the scheme of creation? And what is your view of Job specifically? Poetic God. What is your reaction to Job's speech? Now, it's okay if that's not clear to you until after you hear a lot more of Job's speech, but you should think in this way. <laughs> For Satan, I ask, what is your job description? What's your purpose? What's your view of humans? And what's your relationship to them? The pros, Job, I ask, what's your relationship to God? What do you believe about God? Why do you behave in ways that you do? What do you think that will do for you? Um, and then poetic Job A. Oh, actually, all of the poetic job, Jobs. I ask them just to get inside the arguments in detail. The arguments change, and they're sometimes contradictory. Um, Job's feelings evolve, especially as the friend's responses become more and more unsympathetic. So his, his feelings are going to evolve. Um, and so thinking very specifically. And then with the friends, um, I ask them very specific questions as they're preparing their characters. Um, what is your take on Job's suffering? What are its reasons, its causes, what are its state, what's its nature? So that's number one. What's your take on his suffering? But two, quite distinct from that, what is your take on what is your re, what is your take on Job's reaction to his suffering? Those are two different things. And again, be really specific. Right? How do you how do you judge Job, both for his suffering and his reaction to his suffering? They're specifically different. Um, and also, what is your worldview? What, is, what do you understand the status of human beings to be? What is your assessment of humans and human nature? Um, and then for the amicus briefs, for Ezekiel annotations in 2nd Isaiah, I say, you're, you're about to witness a conversation that's going to be happening. And you are free to chime in. You know, if you ever hear somebody say something that you, you know, say, rah, rah, you know, if you were a British parliamentarian backbencher or something, um, then go ahead and support something that you think you agree with. So Ezekiel 18, you know, what do you think about punishment and suffering and justice in this world and so on? And Lamentations 3, what do you think about charges that God just brutalizes people? Um, and Isaiah as well. What are, what are, how are people supposed to interpret or perceive suffering in their lives? Right? Those are those are things you should be ready to check. So once I give them 15 minutes, and again, this huge hubbub and noise and lots of conversation, people are really getting into it. And then I say, okay, let's let the action begin. Let's start with scene one. And scene one is going to be the whole God scene uh, joke. Right? This is the prose, the first prose part of the, the, the text. And the first time, I mean, I, I had no idea what was going to happen. I thought this was either going to go over, <laughs> done, or it be really great. And literally, I thought of it 20 minutes before walking into the classroom. And I was just totally on the fly. And so, and the good thing is that this is uh, lecture 20, so we are well into the course. We're four lectures away from the end of the course. They know each other right now. So I would not do this the first week, second week. Um, but by now, a lot of good feeling in the classroom. Uh, people feel pretty comfortable and confident around each other. I've had to do a few other things that they kind of, you know, had to bear themselves a little bit. So people are comfortable. So up jumps, you know, the first guy and says, hey, have you seen Joe? <laughs> I just love that Joe. He does everything I want him to do. He is so perfect. He is so upright. He is so blameless. You know, and then it's the time. But but they put they put their own spin on it. You know, and they begin to inject so much more depth and character behind all of it. And um, and one of the greatest moments was when uh, after the second round of suffering, now when Joe's body is actually been afflicted and not just his possessions. Right, and Satan has come back and said, okay, he's still protecting him. You're still coddling him. What do you expect? Of course, he's always going to be faithful to you and pious. You never really make him suffer. He's never had any other challenge his faith. Right? And so the Satan is putting it in all these terms. I thought, this is really good. This person's really getting it. And um, God says, oh, all right. You know, but just this time, just don't take his life. You know, but this close, just go right up to the edge, but not all the way to taking his life. And so, you know, then Job does his whole, you know, when he came to the room or whatever it is. Um, and, and, and his wife says his thing. And, uh, and then it was great because the two kids who were sort of being God and Job just turned to each other and Job said, it doesn't matter. Um, I love you, God. It was just, everyone cracked up, but it was it was so funny because it was just it just all kind of flowed, you know, but they it was, they just did it so well. And then I said, All right, stay, you know, enter enter the, the friends. But and then it started to get very serious. Um, and 
they were really capturing the arguments and the subtleties of the arguments very well. I was flying kind of very fast, and I thought, ooh, I want to make sure people are getting this. So again, unplanned, I went up to the board and said, I would have done this time too. And I started to write down some of the things, sort of summarizing in just little sentences what the friends were saying on one side, what Joel was saying on the other side. I didn't even really quite realize that that's what I was doing, but um, I gave you an example. I began to write down things like, I'm going to kiss the end of over this phone and took a picture of the board and was like, yeah, it's all there. Shoot, where is it? There it is. Yeah. Um, Joe, why pick on me? You scrutinize me too much, right? So why pick on me? Take me, you know, leave me alone. Whereas later he's going to say, where are you? You've totally abandoned me. Like these are the sort of self contradictory things that Joe says in his great picture. Why pick on me? Um, God destroys the blameless and the guilty. Um, he destroys the blameless and, um, and laughs about it, right? Or God is actually responsible for injustice. Um, you know I'm not guilty. Um, it's no good to say something like eventually punishing his sons. No, let the wicked suffer. At this point, hopefully, the Ezekiel person jumps up and says, you know, that's a very good point. <laughs> I'm going to do away with this. I really think we should do away with this generational punishment thing, you know. So, yeah, and they do. Like, they, they pick up on this, right? So you think, ah, oh, they listen back there in Ezekiel, right? Um, so then I also would write on the Job side, there's no retributive justice. There's no delay. Delayed punishment sucks. Um, there's no reward or punishment after death either, right? You this long list of all of his charges against God, um, and there's, but you're just sheer arbitrary power. No man can sue you. You've never get a fair hearing. You distort and pervert justice. You're not only irresponsible as a governor, I remember that one was up there, um, but you actually are a corrupter because you reward the wicked and you don't punish them. You're responsible for the increase of wicked and you actually corrupt and pervert justice. Now, you're not morally neutral. You actually are a corrupter. Okay, so we get this long, long list, which is all coming out from what they're saying. Um, and on the other side, the friends are saying, you know, this is hubris. Um, but their points are subtle, too. They're not simply saying, no, the wicked are always punished and the, and the innocent are always rewarded. They are saying other subtle things, like, you should be glad. This is this punishment. First of all, they're saying, examine yourself. You have to have sinned. God never punishes without sin. And so impute sin from suffering, right? That's the big thing I have on that side. You can always impute sin from suffering. Um, no one is free of sin. Even the angels aren't perfect, so much less human. Humans are worms, they are maggots. We get this refrain coming up, and that's very subversive of other biblical themes about humanity in Genesis 1 and so on, right? So we're putting that up there. God is not only punishing you for your wickedness, he's not punishing you as much as you deserve. Um, just by definition, by nature, you deserve more punishment. Almost like, almost like, almost like, kind of like, really kind of weird. Um, and then the idea that this is a, a chastisement, a discipline of love that you ought to accept willingly, right? So all these ideas, so we end up with these two. Finally, we get to the end of that. It takes about 20, 25 minutes or so. And then I say, okay, God, you need to weigh in on this. And so God shows up. And we first have the poetic um, God come in. And really the two main things that come out of that is, you know, the, where were you? Like, okay, shut up already. I'm big and powerful. Right? So, so the person the person who's playing this God really always has a great time. They stand there saying, you know, where were you? And how do you write that? And they're usually filling in their own things. They're not reading from the text. They're all paraphrasing and summarizing. So they're using different metaphors and images of express power in contemporary society. Right? It's really very fun. Really but, um, so I usually am listening to all this. So I usually go over to the third side of the board and I, I just write down that I'm really big and powerful. Right? And so we get to the end of that. And then everybody just sort of stopped. I remember the first year, we were running out of time at this point. I said, I'm really big and powerful. Um, what else does God say here? Um, he says, you're condemning me so that you can be right. That's interesting. Put that down. So would you condemn me so that you could be right? Um, and then I said, so I'm really big and powerful. How is that an answer to Job's question? How is that? What is Job's question, after all? So you know, usually one of the Job characters will say, you know, um, how, you know, something like, is there any moral governance in the world? Right? Is, is, is there moral governance in the world? And do the innocent suffer for nothing? You know, right? So those are those two questions. Is how is this answer the question? And one person said, I'm really big and powerful, so, so there's a plan. You just don't understand. So I wrote down, there's a plan. And I said, or, someone else said, I'm really big and powerful. And I wrote, 
there's no this is all worked up. <laughs> Which is it? Right? So everyone was sort of stuck. It was really everybody was so gripped because they were so into the drama by this time, right? So I said, all right, let's come back to prose joke. A prose god. Prose god has the last word after all. It's the last part of prose god. So that prose god stands up and says the very first thing that prose god says at the end there, 42 of this. He says, friends, you have spoken falsely. My servant Joe has spoken correctly. It's okay. So wait a minute. <laughs> but these two sides of the war. So who's false? And who's right? And who's Joe said? And what were all the things Joe said? Justice. <laughs> So, and everybody's jaw kind of drops open. And I thought, you know, I say all that in the lecture, right? There's nothing there that I didn't say in the lecture. And yet, sitting there and listening to the lecture kind of do this exposition of the joke just has no, no dramatic impact whatsoever. But it was an extremely emotional experience for everybody that we were going through that. And I'm just running from one side of the other, I got over the side. So I'm like, wait, so who's right? You know, and I'm like, so you're, so God is telling me that all of this is true. And then the bell, and I, you know, the bell rang, it's the metaphor thing, right? It really was the end of class, everybody we were doing, everybody. And so people walk out, I got text messages from people. That was the most amazing class I've ever had. I will never forget Book Joe, for the rest of my life, you know. But, so, um, you know, and then we talked about it the next time. Is what, is that, what does that mean? And why is Joe's response not his wife's response? Why is his response not, then it's meaningless, it's, I just die. But no, instead I'm going to go on living and I'll be righteous, even if you aren't God. And why did he have to reach that moment? And why was that ultimately? the point of the book, that you cannot, in fact, do ever, ever do anything with integrity or righteousness if there's a little bit of or fear of punishment, that it has to be for nothing and work without any meaning. And God is not a moral account, just treating us like little children and rewarding us with the right thing, so we're never able to do the right thing for the right reason, right, as a part of our formation of virtuous care. So, uh, you know, that's the kind of thing you are suddenly free to do, right, when you're not a lecture responsible for conveying content in that frontal lecture kind of thing. Um, that's one of my favorites. Uh, another one that's kind of fun is with the Song of Psalms. Um, we, that's when we do it in sections and split up. So that was that we do the whole class together. But when we do it in sections, the Song of Songs, um, do a few things. But for Carter, at least like a half an hour of it, I have a couple people, we're, we're going to put this on as a movie or a play. Only the first two chapters <laughs> because it's long. It gets risque, so I'm only going to do the first two, I think, I can't remember exactly how far in the next chapter, but, um, you know, the opening kind of conversations, and so we need a director, so I usually get one or two people to direct, and I said, but first, we're going to work as a cast to go through this, to figure out the blocking, right? Where are you standing, where are you looking, and who are you talking to? Well, you know, people think, okay, that easy, right? We'll try it. Right? The very first thing, you don't know who's there and who's not. And, and so I help them out with the female and male you know, forms of things which you can't tell in English sometimes. So I'll say that's a feminine you know, um, subject for now. So because she was talking to you or he was talking to you. So I'll help them out with a few of those. But for the most part, you can tell from the English. You've got a couple of them you can't. But they'll realize that she seems to be talking to him, but wait, he's not there. And then all of a sudden, these daughters of Jerusalem <laughs> are and where did they come from? And then the next thing you know, she sees him coming and she's talking to him at a distance, but then he answers. So he's actually there. So how so they suddenly realize that this is this really interesting um, format. So I actually so I mean back it out. The, the, the director, they, they make decisions together, they mark the text, okay, who's gonna be where? And then they actually act it out, which makes it come to life. And it's it's so fascinating because they have to remember who, sometimes in the middle of a speech, someone has to appear who wasn't there before. And sometimes they have to turn in the middle of the speech. And I, my favorite moment was the one time where one group decided that something was embedded speech, but that the person, even though the person wasn't there, they became real in the talking. So what they happened, what they did was, it was the woman speaking, and when she says, you know, behold, here comes my love leaping over mountains, whatever, and he stood in the back of the room and he dutifully left and was sort of standing to the to stage right, and she's saying these various things about him, and then at one point she says that he says to her, you know, away the eyes my love and come away for both the years of the past and so on. Um, but she, so that's, she is quoting him, and what they did was they had her speaking, and then she got softer, and he started speaking and took over so that it 
turned into his speech through her. I thought that was just so perfect. He does. So when we finished all this, I said, if you actually saw a film, you know, which did this, what would be the genre? What would you say? Is this a dream, a dream sequence? The whole thing is as a dream sequence. We'd be using fade-ins and fade-outs, and a person can imagine speaking to someone, and then the next thing you know, they're actually there, and then they go back to being their imagination. And I don't think you can capture any of that if you just tell kids, go be song songs. You just, they just, none of that's going to come alive to them. So, I think I'm done. But that was <laughs> just to give you an idea of the potential um, when you can deliver content through lectures online and you're free of the responsibility of that. And you can embed it in a course in a way that you know students will do it, that they really are responsible for it, major parts of their grade <laughs> depend on it. Um, and they will do it, then it frees you to find other ways to get them to truly encounter the text and to internalize it, you know, in ways that are just not possible. That would be a syllabus too, which you have somewhere. But anyway, yes, so there's the syllabus, and it's very long, very detailed, and all the secondary themes are on there. But, um, you'll notice on page two, that's where I explain under number four, the class discussion. So now I call them class discussions, participation. In class, we will have these participation. It's really pretty important for learning how to write a paper. That's why you have to come to class. You can't just watch the lectures. And if you're not in class, or especially in the small group discussions, the grade will be adjusted so that you know, it counts for a larger part of your grade. And then I give a little brief summary of what each lecture is on that runs through the first uh, through page seven. And then the schedule of readings is on pages eight through eleven. So that's the secondary readings. And those are sometimes we discuss in class for a discussion. But really a lot of the class time is spent encountering the text. What they don't know is that they've got twice the course kids used to have when they first took this class ten years ago. Twice the amount of material, if not three times. It's, it's really a huge, you know, what, what, what is accomplished in this class is huge. I sometimes go a little bit guilty for that or not. For the most part, it seems to work. They don't really seem to know that they're, they're doing that much more. Um, they don't really seem to know. Sometimes, and I did come back on some of the secondary reading. Partly because now I can do, you know, you, sometimes you assign secondary readings because you can't say everything in lecture. But I've got 150 minutes a week now. So I actually don't, I, I've cut back on some of the secondary readings because I can introduce that. I can give them for 10 minutes a week or some Otherwise, you look at the trash and think, what, what is it? 
this is weird. The text doesn't say that. Why are they telling me the text says it? It obviously doesn't, right? So the first thing I would probably do is I would look at the verse. I write it on the board if I could do this. I write it on this verse, and I, and I write it the way it's actually in the Jewish study Bible. Unfortunately, I hate the way they have it. They have, take your son, your only son, um, Isaac, whom you love. That's not the Hebrew order. It's take your son, your only son, the one you love, Isaac. And that's very important for the Midrash. It has to be that order. So I will write that on the board. I'll say, this is the actual Hebrew order. I'll say, this is the word order. The Hebrew, your translation has changed the word order. But that, and I said, but just, let's just stop and pause for a minute. Do Isaac and Abraham, I mean, do Abraham and God know each other at this point? Have they been, you know, talking to one another? Is God, like, up on the family history? Why doesn't he just say, you know what, is there anything odd about this sense? And you can usually listen from one of them. Why doesn't he just say, take Isaac? So, and by now they're already primed a little bit too to the fact that I say that um, there's so much verbal economy and, and biblical narrative. I've introduced them to Robert Walter. I've introduced them to some of these ideas. There's a lot of verbal economy and biblical narrative. So when something seems to go on at length, you know, you have to ask yourself, why all this verbiage? This is verbiage for the biblical narrator. Um, so they're tuned to this now already. So we won't look at the Midrash yet until we've done a thorough, why, why does they just say take Isaac? And then people will say, well, yeah, I don't know. What's, what's the rhetorical, so I'll say, what's the rhetorical effect of putting these various phrases to take your son, your only son, the one you love? I said, well, then they come up with all kinds of great theories. Well, it's like he's torturing him almost, right? Or I, whatever. They'll come up with a bunch of stuff. And then by the time you pick this up, are you kidding? This is, they've already said it. It's in here. And it no longer looks strange. And suddenly they see how they trash works and why they're going to work it. It's not just a bunch of people saying weird stuff. It's not that. So then they get this. Now see what, what Midrash does. It says, Midrash, I, I always tell them, I always use Wicked as an example. I don't know if you've ever seen Wicked. You have to see Wicked if you want to understand it. You have to see Wicked. <laughs> so, I'm one of these people who grew up on The Wizard of Oz. You know, I was back in the day when it showed on television once a year, and like life stopped for every child in America. All you talked about from the three weeks before at school was that The Wizard of Oz was coming out on Sunday night, you know, whatever, and then it, all of the world stopped, and everyone watched it, and we all knew every word of it by heart, and then, you know, you wait till the next year, and you can see it again, right? So, this is something they know very well. Wicked is the other side of the story, which flips good and bad. You know, Dorothy is this awful creep, and the wicked witch of the West is the one you're looking for in the end. And do they change a single detail of the Wizard of Oz? Not one detail. Not one detail of the original has changed, but inserted in between are the things that were left out of the Wizard of Oz. And how the wicked witch, you know, and Linda, is uh, actually. It's really not Linda's, not that point. Dorothy's a son, she's a character. Linda and, and the Wicked Witch are sisters, but Linda was just pampered and privileged and, and the smart and really clever and really wonderful and self-sacrificing sister got shafted, <laughs> right? And in the end, made this act of tremendous self-sacrifice. It's, it's fascinating, right? But you suddenly realize she's the little one who's the one, right? But not in the detail, but you just know, the You're just the absolute one. So I would say to them, that's Midrash. Wicked is a Midrash of um, the Wizard of Oz. And that's exactly what the rabbis do. They've taken this verse. Have they changed a word in the verse? No. Take your son, to which Abraham is not going back to. And therefore, now we understand why God moves on to the next part of the verse. There's an event that happened between the two parts of the verse that motivate now the next two words in the verse, right? Your only son. And now there's going to be another event that motivates the movement to the next part of God's speech. But what we have here is not just one sentence. We have three pieces of telephone conversation in the very one side. And then we try to see the other end of the conversation. And you know, okay, well, I have one son and his mother, and the child's only son and her mother. Son you love. Watch. Love them both, right? Okay? Yeah. And then the rest. So this is just a rabbi's way of dramatizing what we ourselves, before looking at the Midrash, just noticed. Does God go through this? So the rabbis just dramatize that for us uh, from the uh, from further. Why is there this worn out speech on God's part? And then they, they formulate the question, they say, well, so it might not overwhelm him, it might not stun him, stun him. Or maybe to make um, Isaac even more beloved in his eyes. Well, then we start having conversations about is Isaac beloved in his eyes. I have a whole very weird interpretation of the Abraham and Isaac's part. I love it. His father's eyes is only to look at so then they start going back and read. So, so we're talking.
talking and thinking and kind of reading a little bit out loud, and it's not as if we just want to sit and read things through. I think especially with Midrash, we can find people for it, you know, and then I might ask someone to read it. Sometimes I think it's important to read them to give them a certain emphasis. So that first one, I would read. I would read because I would want to have a certain emphasis. But beyond that, I let them read them out loud. But I ask them to go through the same process. What in the verse are they responding to? Because that's what they're asking. Just to test it down. What are they responding to? Not just enough to say the rabbi is looking at them. Tell me how they're looking at that verse. What is it that's remarkable to them about that verse? The fact that it has so many clauses. I mean, they just a take Isaac. And given their exegetical assumptions that this is a perfect text and nothing is not meaningful, they're, they're compelled to find meaning in that. Right? So how do they do that? But that's what we're doing it when I go over that. Any kind of text. What are their assumptions? What are their operating method? And what are they reacting to in the text? So anyway, the, so yeah, it just it really just depends on, on the material. But other times like with Ecclesiastes stuff, they're sitting together and reading passages out loud to each other and talking about what it means. And I don't, so sometimes I feel like there's a need to direct and control the world more. No, I do I thought that I'd have to wait past your time. It's 2212. Oh, 122. I probably would work out just about right, because the, the, the amount of time it took to describe it to you is roughly about the amount of time it takes me to add down in another 10 minutes. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. I hope that this is all, and I hope there's stuff that applies to the classes other than the dialogue. We thank you for listening to or viewing our podcast. For more information and for other podcasts, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. Copyright, the University of Chicago Divinity School.